Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's Maker Talk. My name is Diane Olivo Posner, and I am the Principal Librarian, Associate Director for the Exploration and Creativity Department of Los Angeles Public Library. And today I am joined by my colleague, Vi Ha, the lead librarian for our Octavia Lab at the Central Library. Well, you might be asking you, what is a Maker Talk? Our Maker programs feature makers from Los Angeles and beyond. A maker could be a grandma who loves to knit and crochet. A maker can be your neighbor who brews beer, makes wine and cheese and creates beautiful handmade jewelry. A maker can be a barbecue pit master, a robotist, a medalist, a glass blower, origami expert, gardener, baker, toy maker, and echo fashion designer. Makers are inventors, but they don't just invent. They innovate, hack, and repurpose existing or obsolete technologies, equipment, and knowledge, and take what we already know and give it a new use. So if you are anyone who, if you or anyone you know are makers, please email us at ecdept at lapl.org. We would love to feature you as our next maker. Now, let me bring on Viha so she can introduce today's makers. Hi, Hello, me. everybody. Hello, Diane. Thank you so much for allowing us this opportunity. We're very excited to be showcasing the Los Angeles Clean Tech Incubators Advanced Prototyping Center. Um, a little bit about the Octavia Lab first. We are the first maker space at the Los Angeles Public Library. We're located at the Central Library and people are, are able to use the space for free with, a, with their own library card. I don't have a library card on my hand right now, but imagine a library card. And with it, we allow them to 3D print, you can poster print, there's graphic design software, there is a laser cutter, there's a little itty CNC mill, all sorts of stuff. A little bit about how the Octavia Lab during this past year was working with the Los Angeles Clean Tech Incubator Advanced Prototyping Center, Lacey APC. And together, we were actually able to create uh, uh, PPE for frontline medical workers. So in that relationship, we became very, very close with this team. And it is with great honor that I introduced Nick Albert with the Advanced Prototyping Center. Hey everyone, how are you doing today? Hi V. Great to- We are uh, not talking to you every day, I have to say. I know, I know. I know. We, we spent uh, a lot of time working hard, figuring out the, the right plan of attack to, um, to make face shields and get them to hospitals that needed them. And um, it was really neat to, to develop a coalition of, uh, of makers and of innovators and manufacturers just to see the, the city come together and um, that's that's really what the point is here at uh, La Crest Innovation. This sound just dropped out. The prototyping center to develop technologies. Startup companies. Yeah, Nick, your sounds bad. So. No. So, so basically the Los Angeles Clean Tech Incubator is located in the Arts District and it is a joint project a little bit. Though Nick will be able to explain it better than I can. And their focus is on creating a workforce, built, there are going to be people who do this better than I can, a workforce development that is inclusive, it's green, creating that green economy, and just being this kind of incubator of like, great, great. How that, am I back? Yeah, you're back now. Thank you. Great. All I'm right, so let's sorry. do this. Okay, so uh, thank you. Sorry for the short break. Uh, we, so here, uh, there are emerging technologies, there's new technologies and startup companies being developed. Uh, the intention was actually to support the clean tech corridor development and to enable smart manufacturing and industry 4.0 to come to LA. So we're doing that here. Uh, we have the, um, Loritz is actually in the, the parking lot. We wanna show you the campus. We wanna give you a little bit of a, a visual of, of what we're doing at the Lacrette's Innovation Campus. 
we have in, in our parking lot to, to um, shade our vehicles is also uh, solar panels in, in the parking lot that serves our own on-site microgrid. And so we, cool. as we are partners with the La uh, Los Angeles Department of Water and Power, we uh, are working with them for new technologies to uh, promote clean energy development and uh, businesses in Los Angeles. So uh, you can see the front of the doors. Let's go on in and, uh, and head down to the prototyping center. But what's un unique about this campus is that there are startup companies here that um, are engaged at different levels of development and there's resources available for them. And also, if you look to the left, there is the customer engagement lab for the Department of Water and Power. You can learn a lot about what the department is doing to be more efficient, to save uh, all the customers money and, and to uh, be more efficient with uh, the processes. So it's fantastic uh, space to view them there and get educated about how they uh, are seeking sustainability. So let's head down to the prototyping center. Um, in, in another tour as well, we can take a look at more of the campus where uh, startup companies uh, become campus members and they are able to have offices here and conduct meetings and, and uh, we have an amphitheater for presentations. Uh, so we, we are very honored to actually work directly with Department of Water and Power. We share the same space. Uh, the building was renovated um, in, from an old furniture factory into what is now a, uh, a very lively area. So now let's let's go into the prototyping center here. And if there are any questions, please please feel free to answer in, or add them into the chat. So when you walk into the prototyping center, on your left hand side here is an electronics lab. So uh, you actually see, <laughs> uh, you know, these are not animatronics; these are actual people that are working in in the labs. Uh, developing prototypes, testing technology with multiple different um, facets to it. New, you know, from from the electronics and microcontrollers, sensories or sensory technology, and, um, and different uh, newly developed solutions. Uh, our I, our intention is to enable the workspace and the testing capabilities uh, for for startup companies. So our our um, Members of our uh, organization can come in and, and use the labs. We work together to support them in the ecosystem. So this is just a, a glimpse at the electronics lab now. It's obviously work in progress. And um, let's go ahead and turn around to the wet lab. So wet lab is chemistry lab, right? We have fume hoods, we have uh, deionized water, we have different um, tools and supplies for conducting experiments. What's unique about this is startup companies get to work directly alongside the utility. And the utility has an, has an opportunity to see and test and possibly implement new technology. So um, it's happening right in front of your eyes. This is, there's actually experiments going on and uh, people working hard to advance the uh, the way that we handle um, technology and, and emerging technologies into the utilities uh, services. So let's keep going. There's no questions about the wet lab. Let's head over to the core lab. Sorry, I have a where, question. Yes. Nick, so what do people do in the wet lab? Is it more like chemistry experiments or is it for like what what is what is an example of something people someone could do in there? Right now, what's going on? Great question. Uh, we are uh, working with one of our startup companies who's developing sensors that go into water and will test water quality. So it's a much more advanced way of monitoring water in different areas. So we have several reservoirs, and we want to we want to be able to stay on top of any chemicals, any content, any kind of things that are that are going on in the water and, and monitor that. So that's what uh, Fluidion does. That's what the company that's working in there now. They work directly 
uh, with DWP testing their systems. So um, it helps us to stay more uh, in control and aware of what's in our water and uh, helping to maintain the system. Cool. We also did recently some soil experiments. So to find, they were testing uh, a company called Seedbox Systems that works with us, uh, one of our portfolio companies. They were testing uh, techniques for soil remediation. So cleaning soil, making it more viable. Um, that's a really important thing for our ecosystem. Uh, you're looking at what is uh, sort of a storage room, but there's low temperature freezers in here. What you can see on the right hand side that is currently not uh, in use, but will be very soon. This is a hydroponics system for uh, uh, testing different um, foods and teaching people about indoor horticulture so that they can grow their own food inside. Uh, we, we were doing this for about six months um, before the holidays and eating lots of greens. We've got some, some great um, seeds that we're ready to put in there, but that is a deep water culture system for, uh, for growing plants inside. So it's Wait. one of the things that we're considering, yeah. Is this something that you actually built in house or is this something that you bought off of? Oh, um, I actually built that from scratch. <laughs> and used it in my garage and fed my family for six months during the lockdowns. So basically you will. So now now we're, get. we're trying to, yeah. to share the technology and, and let people know that they have the ability to do this too. Very inexpensive. Let's head over to uh, the welding lab and the 3D printing lab. I'd love to introduce Loritz and uh, um, have him talk about the, uh, the 3D printing lab after we check out this, one of my favorite rooms in the whole place. This is where we can make a lot of sparks. There's uh, industrial welders in here and there's a closed loop system so that you can grind and uh, finish uh, metal in here and it helps you to stay safe while, while there's fumes and dust being created. These, there's a TIG welding and MIG welding in this space, which are very popular for prototyping. And uh, we are also, um, we will begin teaching classes uh, in these two processes as well, so that you can come in and, and learn how to weld with us eventually. Yeah, let's, uh, let's check out that welding room. I'd love to introduce Loritz, because this is his, his uh, real area of uh, interest in here. Uh, hi, everyone. Um, I'll try to get the camera to pan to me quickly. Say hello. Hello. Um, right. Hi, Lee. Uh, so right now we are in the 3D printing room. It also has uh, industrial level sewing and a large format printer. Essentially, you're a typical household printer, but just uh, five times the size. And so in this room, like Nick was mentioning, here we have uh, 3D printers, which is, in my opinion, at least, a extremely useful tool when it comes to prototyping and developing ideas, as well as it has its um, perks when it comes to being an efficient and green technology for prototyping as well. So in this room, we have uh, four different 3D printers. This would be our newest edition, the Modix. The nice thing about this is the build size. You can actually print a medium sized dog in here. Um, with, it has a, a two foot by two feet by four foot volume. So you can really make some large parts in there. Then we have uh, three other 3D printers over here, um, industrial level 3D printers and high level um, hobbyist 3D printers as well. So that way you can be creative with the materials that you use. What kind of 3D printers are they? And what materials do you use? Oh, great question. Um, the two printers that are most directly in front of me are, uh, well, all the printers in here are FDM printers, which is fused deposition modeling. Uh, if you're not familiar with that form of 3D printing, you could imagine squeezing a tube of toothpaste out and creating that line of uh, toothpaste and then stacking that up layer by layer to create the shape of the parts you want. But these printers will do that, that line to a much smaller degree, very fine in computer controls, and uh, it will melt and extrude plastics so that we can create intricate shapes like these. 
which are still also very thin, as you can see, thin walls. Um, so once you have your 3D model, the that 3D model can be uh, transferred to the 3D printer, and it replicates that with uh, extruded plastic or other materials. Um, as for your material question, these two printers here use ABS, which is um, one of the materials that we do use. This one, we mainly use PLA, but since it's also more so of an open source printer, you can use other materials that are out there on the market, such as um, PETG or PLA with different infused materials, such as wood or copper or iron even. So that way you can have some of the properties of those materials. And then this printer, the Modix, like I'd mentioned at first, also can use a variety of materials. And uh, one of the cool materials that we've gotten and are in the process of testing would be uh, this one here from one of our uh, partners that we're working with to create a more circular economy when it comes to 3D printing. This is from closed loop plastics. Um, and this material is actually made from red solo cups. So they would recycle red solo cups and make it into 3D printer filament. So that way we can use this for our prototyping needs. Is the Modix I, also an FDM also? Sorry, sorry, Nick. Oh, no. Thank you for making sure I clarified that. Yeah, uh, the Modix is also an FDM printer. Yeah, and the red solo cups are high impact polystyrene, just from the peanut gallery. Uh, then just finishing up the room, we have the uh, industrial sewing machines here that you can use if you're making, you know, to support the fashion district in the downtown L area, as well as to, for anyone that has wearable tech or fabrics that would be included in their prototype. And then the large format printer that I mentioned before, um, it's essentially a very large household printer, but it can do a variety of materials as well as cutting out the, um, the shapes of that print. So that way, if you need to make stickers, banners, decals for your prototype, all of those types of things can be printed on this printer. Um, I think that would be about it for this room, unless there are any questions, of course. As in, a, it's, a, it's a sublimation printer or is it an inkjet printer? It'd be an Sorry. inkjet printer. Okay, and the materials are basically, I saw there are rolls back there. Is that just paper or are there other materials back there? Um, in terms of the material options we have, um, there would be regular printer, a couple of vinyl adhesives, uh, matte, glossy, glossy poster, and satin canvas. Wow, thank you. Of course, no problem. And one thing to add is that we we do uh, um, provide services uh, on request as well. So if someone wants to um, have a print that that possibly can't be done at the Octavia Lab, we're able to support some of that work as well. Just uh, some of that. Is that a whiteboard table I spy? Uh, yes, over here. This entire table is actually. The grid that's on there is a whiteboard material, and it's also one giant sticker that was printed on the large format printer that we mentioned before. So it has like yeah. multiple uses. Whiteboard, um, a grid for measuring your fabric when you're using the sewing machine, um, and then also showcases the, the capability and the size capacity of that printer that we have. Cool, thank you. Seriously, if anybody in the audience has questions, please. This is a lot of fun. Thank you so much for taking the time. Yeah, when, soon we'll have the uh, 3D scanner in there. It's over in the computer lab now, but uh, Laura's had some fun with it yesterday. We, we do have a, a high definition 3D scanner. How big does it scan? Or what, can I put me eight, in it? Or eight inch, eight inch diameter at this point. Um, but we're going to expand that. We we wanted to get the the software, you know, consistent and, and set up and tested, and we're going to expand the size from there. So now we're in the machine shop. Uh, this is where uh, this is a really unique room. It's intended for multiple industrial processes in here, and the way we've set it up is very modularly, so we can adapt the projects that we have. Because sometimes we have larger projects and uh, we need to move things around. So things are on wheels, things are, are pallet jackable and rearrangeable in the space. 
We have uh, companies that often uh, will donate equipment to us or will bring in specific equipment in order to accomplish a certain job. Uh, so we work together with uh, different companies and we, um, you know, we're also fortunate to have uh, funding from the EDA and from LEDWP and um, Lacey essentially manages this space uh, for the Department of Water and Power. So we are very fortunate to have um, access to this space and, and to be able to uh, manage it and, uh, and enable access for our startup companies as well for the community. Um, uh, so pretty soon we're gonna introduce Sharon here. Uh, she's from our workforce development uh, group and we, we are very excited to talk with her as well about how we're integrating the, uh, the fellowship programs and educational side of the industrial processes that we have. So you can see some of the face shields here that uh, we work on um, with the, these are actually the uh, die cut uh, versions where we, we wanted to save the time in 3D printing. We were very, um, uh, we had a lot of challenges with material uh, during the pandemic. We had scarcities across the board and we wanted to do consistent improvement in the products themselves. So you can see two different face shields there. One of them is like a rev re revision number four. And that one that he's holding now is like revision number seven. Uh, we went through lots of process improvement throughout. Um, we even wanted to eliminate the small dots that were getting punched out. And so we had less small pieces of plastic. And, um, so, but we ended up in total delivering over 125,000 face shields to local hospitals. And uh, we actually still have quite, quite a bit um, here. We also um, we're able to support the employment of over 230 at-risk youth um, during the, the time through the um, uh, Youth at Work program with LA County uh, Workforce and Development, Aging and Community Services. That's correct. Um, so we, we are very fortunate to have partnered with uh, LAPL and Octavia Lab because that what you're seeing is, is a result of our uh, collaboration um, and hard work. Um, so I wanted to say, you know, thank you V for working so hard with us and, and uh, everyone at the Octavia Lab and LAPL. Um, and a big shout out to, our sh to the shipping department of the Los Angeles Public Library. We're deeply, deeply yes. grateful for their work. We are, we are very grateful for, for all of you and, and uh, all the hard work and, and time that was spent. Uh, so what you're looking at in front of you here behind that curtain is a very powerful machine uh, that is a CNC water jet cutter uses 60,000 PSI to cut through any material um, you want. Basically, you've probably seen, if you've ever seen water jet cutting on, on YouTube, you can see people cutting through bowling balls. You can see uh, through very, you know, very precise work. Um, you can actually cut steel with this. Uh, and you have a four foot by eight foot area to draw anything in, the, on, in CAD and then program the water jet to cut it out. Um, so this machine works similarly more to, so first of all, CNC stands for com what? Computer numerical control. Okay. And when you are cutting something with a water jet in this way, does it only cut like a drawing, like a straight line, or can it do shapes also? Like... Like, can it actually make a bowling ball or can it only cut things in half? That kind of thing. Well, actually what you're seeing is a perfect answer to that. Uh, this is text. This is a sign that was made uh, out of eighth inch aluminum. And it's, it's very precise um, text in there. So essentially any drawing, if you can use a laser cutter, if you can draw a two dimensional CAD drawing, uh, that's what we need. We need a drawing exchange file and it will in It'll come into the computer and we program it based on the material we're trying to cut. And uh, we set up that material properly so that it will stay in the machine. And the, we orient the machine in the right location so that we can uh, save material and also get the best results. So um, during the pandemic, we actually cut stacks of 10 sheets at a time when we were cutting the face sheet. 
Um, Go ahead. CAD drawings. What software are you using for those of us? Uh, uh, we are using um, Autodesk Fusion 360. We use uh, Vectric 3D um, Aspire software, also SolidWorks. Uh, we are sponsored by Autodesk. We have um, that available to our community as well, and we help to um, send, you know, get get startup companies engaged with uh, having free set CAD software for a year from Autodesk. Um, and and uh, we often use Fusion 360 for 3D modeling and, and 2D programming. Cool. Yeah, Fusion 360 is free for hobbyist users. And then you guys are home thinking about taking up uh, learning a, a CAD software. All you need is an email account. And you're able to sign yourself up. Thank you, V. You got it. So what you also see in here is a mix of different um, complementary equipment. So if you're going to you cut plastic sheets or metal sheets, you need a shear. That's what you're looking at in front of you there. It's a, a How old machine. is this thing? That is actually quite new. That's really? probably a year, a year old, yes. No, because it, it looks will, like something that's probably it was 50, designed years year ago. Physical. Yeah. Yeah, they, they make these uh, shears. They've been making them for years, and now they have conversions so that you, they use much less power. Uh, so with 120 PSI in an airline, they can convert that power into hydraulic power, and we can cut 12-gauge steel, which is almost an eighth of an inch thick. And so our, our goal not only is to enable the process, but to make it better and to use less power doing it. Um, and then you can see also in the distance behind that is a, a sheet metal bender, which we've also bent uh, polycarbonate plastic with. Uh, we can, it's a box pan break, so we can, we can fold material uh, into different shapes. And sometimes I like to say you can make origami with this if you do it right. Uh, well, these um, up to 12 gauge as well. So we want to set that really as our sheet metal working threshold. Um, and then just beyond that, you can see a Haas mini mill. That's another CNC machine with very high precision. Um, and it's great for prototyping because it's not huge, but it will, will, will enable you to do very precise cuts uh, repeatedly. And you can see some of Lawrence's work in there now. And we use, often use three, uh, Fusion 360 for that. Uh, there's uh, our blank for the uh, key to the city. It's one of the things that we're honored to work on over here. Um, and it, it demonstrates the, the precision. If you look at look at City Hall on, on this key, <laughs> look at that that detail in three dimensions. I mean, that's that's really uh, unique. And you can see Mayor Eric Garcetti written is on there. Is this a blank or is this a mold? What is this, this is just a test. This is our program test for the, the LA City side. And uh, the, what the other side of this specific design uh, was given to the Stan Lee Foundation uh, in honor of his contribution to Los Angeles. Uh, it had his face engraved in 3D, beautiful, beautiful piece. Uh, it was a great community effort. So that's the, that's the Haas. On the right-hand side from Loritz is also a, a, a lathe, a CNC lathe. You can turn round materials and make um, uh, threaded pieces, just like that. And then we also have another mill. Behind him there is more uh, a, a conventional type mill, but it also has CNC programming capabilities. We have a, a nice drill press. And so the lathe, sorry, the lathe is specifically to mill round objects and a mill is basically to carve out flat objects or can it also do round objects uh it can also do round objects the the lathe is more appropriate for material that's rounded that you're going to be turning so you can stick a pipe in there and cut it to a certain size or mill different contours inside of it um, just like he showed you you can actually make a screw so it'd be much more difficult to make a threaded part on a mill than it would be to 
to spin it at a certain speed and have a cutting tool cut in the threads. So that's basically what this does is it, it cuts the threads along the, the contour uh, of, the, uh, of the part. And uh, if I might add, I feel like a good description for a lathe for those that aren't familiar, it's very similar to a pottery wheel, except you'd be using it for harder materials and having a computer or, or manually controlling tools to carve into it. Okay, thanks. Uh, one of our newest additions that we're really excited about is a CNC router. So we are moving also into th this machine isn't as much for metal as it is for wood and plastic and uh, other softer materials. You can do aluminum on this, but there, here's a new uh, addition to the shop here where you can put a four foot by eight foot sheet material on it and program it to to cut all types of shapes. I would love to do a topographical map of the city on here. There's there's going to be some fun projects coming out of this. Uh, fantastic. All right. What's the difference between a CNC mill and a CNC router? Ah, great. So uh, the the two things that that make the difference. A mill is intended for harder materials. CNC mill specifically is um, you know, able to hold a very tight tolerance on hard materials. That means it needs to be very rigid. It needs to be also able to flood with coolant so you can keep the materials and the cutters cool um, during the process. Uh, so there's, um, there's a very, very um, rigid system around that. And there's a little more give on the CNC router where it is it doesn't handle as much what we call deflection. So something pushing against the bit and it um, not being able, or it flexing as it pushes back, right? So what the router does, it's more intended for wood sheet materials so that you can put a big sheet of material and you can cut shapes. You see, if you look up uh, CNC router furniture, you can see lots of different furniture that's made from CNC routers and it is based on a sheet material. So it'll cut out a profile and then, or it'll engrave in 3D uh, into uh, the material. Uh, okay. Typically it won't use coolant and you'll use a vacuum to remove any of the chips or, or dust. Okay. Um, so both of these technologies, the mill and the router primarily does things on an X, Y axis. X, Y, like pretty much it's a flat drawing and it drills down or can it do or can it do different angles or? Um, or? It is a Cartesian system, it's three axis. So you have X, Y, Z, and uh, it is programmable in three dimensions. So it won't cut something underneath an object, but you can cut varying, uh, very precise levels in three dimensions. So you could, uh, like you saw in the, with the city, with the city, the key to the city, that's a three dimensional uh, cut, the router can do the same thing, the mill is the same way, but it won't turn the head to cut at an angle itself. You need a bit that's straight up and down, vertically. All right, I want to ask one dumb question left. Okay, all right, so these are CNC, so how do I feed an instruction to it? Is it through a USB? Do I bring a computer over? How does that work? Uh, this would be something that uh, we would run for you, right? If mm -hmm. you're not in our workforce development program that we're going to ask uh, Sharon to speak on a little bit, then um, then we would basically uh, run it for you. You send us your files, we'll send you back a, a quote for running the job, and then uh, you, if you can supply the material, we schedule it and we, we take care of it. And you can be a part of that as well. We can do a live feed video because we're essentially we're close to the public right now, but we are providing those services. Cool. Thank you. Not a dumb question. Not a dumb question, by the way. Thank you. Uh, so if you take a look to your left, also we'll can continue panning around. Um, what we what you didn't see is the the chop saw and the table saw, but we have saws for metal cutting here, as well as a, um, some of our 
uh, one of our prototypes from BMW. This is a, a scooter, a micro mobility uh, scooter here, where we are working on uh, workforce development programs. And uh, we're, we will soon have a cohort actually to teach people how to do uh, professional maintenance on, on these uh, types of equipment. So I um, wanted to, to ping Sharon to see if, if Sharon is on the line. Maybe she can talk about some of the cohorts coming up. Thanks so much, Nick. Hi, can you guys hear me okay? Hi, Sharon. Uh Hi. So yeah, thank you. That was actually a perfect segue. Um, so yeah, I'd love to talk to you guys about one of our workforce development training programs coming up. So as Nick had mentioned, um, something that's coming up around February is when we're going to launch the program. We're actually going to launch the applications to apply next week. Uh, but in for about like four to six weeks, certain participants Participants who go through our program will learn how to do the maintenance and repair of micro mobility slash e mobility devices, such as e scooters and e bikes. Uh, so, participants who go through our training receive technical training as well as um, interpersonal skills. So, let's say you learn all these technical skills, but you want to find a job within clean technology or uh, within the sustainable work place, you want to be prepared with your resume and interview skills. So we have a career coach who works with our participants to help them get ready for that stage. Um, in addition to that, we also provide participants with opportunities to work with some of the startups who are building things within that makerspace, or uh, some of our partners who are looking for a potential internship or, um, uh, sorry, potential interns or potential um, participants to get hired. Oh, thank you, Sharon. When does that start again? Yeah, so the applications will launch next week. Um, if anyone is interested, I highly recommend shooting an email at workforce at uh, The actual training will start in February. Nice. And you also are going to have the micro grid training and EV technician training coming up? Yeah, so the micro grid training that will begin in March. And then the EVSC network technician training will start sometime in uh, fall of this year. Um, okay. So yeah, for more details, definitely shoot me an email. I have a question. What is a microgrid? And what is EV, the other vocabulary word you used also? <laughs> yeah, no, feel free to chime in, Nick, because I feel like you may have a little bit more expertise on what an actual microgrid is. But that oh. is the participants who go through our training will learn about the battery and storage of like uh, solar energy, of battery energy, and stuff like that. Um, anything you want to add to that, Nick? Yeah, a microgrid is basically a smaller version of the of a power plant. Uh, it, it takes the power that comes from the utility, breaks it down into the different uh, service needs of the place where it is. So if it's a residential area, you know, often you'll see uh, a DWP building that um, you don't really see too many people at, but there's a bunch of hardware in, in the back and, and lights that are going on and off. That's essentially a substation. Uh, so from a substation, then it goes down into a microgrid where you have uh, power that's actually coming from our solar, pan solar panels in the parking lot into this, this small management facility for less power that, uh, that supplies the, the needs of that building. So there is a lot of that coming up. There's a lot of that being built infrastructure-wise for in, in, in the nation, really, but in Los Angeles, that's our focus. So we're going to need people to do that, and those are jobs that are being created. So we want, and so what Sharon's talking about is um, the process for you, for people in, on this call or on, you know, in the ecosystem or in Los Angeles, anywhere that want to learn how to uh, work on that equipment and need jobs and want to be in the clean tech uh, green economy. And what was the other one that started with EVG or EVD? I'm sorry, I didn't catch that. Oh, no worries. Yeah. So the other one is for uh, EV network tech or EVSE network technicians. So pretty much uh, we're hosting a training program, which will teach participants how to do the maintenance, troubleshooting and repair of the actual EV chargers. Um, so yeah. So the things we see Tesla's parking into that thing exactly yeah okay just making sure okay yeah there's so much talk about you know electric vehicles and we're we're part of the transportation electrification partnership 
it's really important for us to to see those those changes. But in, in order for those changes to take place, then, then we need workers that are trained to to support that infrastructure. We need people investing in startups that are that are that are putting the infrastructure out there, meaning the chargers are going out on the street and they need people to fix them and work on them. And, and the, uh, there needs to be a, a place where people can learn and then get and train and get those jobs and certifications. So that's what we're enabling here as well. And these trainings are free. I mean, like wow, six months training and you get to be joining a amazing, amazing new technology. Yeah. Right. Right. Exactly. Yeah, the training will be completely free. The only requirements are um, 18 and up L.A. County res resident um, and your, I guess, interest in clean technology and sustainability. Sign me up. So is there um, anything else that uh, you'd like to see here? The laser in the, cutter. In the presentation? Oh, the laser cutter. OK. Sorry. All right. So uh, we let's head to the laser room. And we have two Epilog laser cutters uh, that we we're actually currently working on as well to make some improvements and do some maintenance. Uh, so we have a, a Helix and a Fusion. And both are connected to fume extractors. There's my reminder. Oh, I love seeing the new grate in there. That's awesome. When we were cutting all that, um, that uh, PET for the face shields, it really did a number on all the, uh, the parts inside the laser. So we're now doing the maintenance on those. Uh, and it works very similarly to the water jet cutter. Uh, takes the uh, same kind of file. In fact, even more fi types of files. You can, you can uh, laser cut from you know, images and PDFs and you don't need to do the same type of uh, CAD drawing necessarily. But the, the versatility is there. And this is something that's really great to, uh, to have in, an, in a maker space and to know how to use because this is, a, this is an industry standard now uh, that a lot of, of, of products can be developed on and tested. And you know, um, we, we've, we do a lot of cross, um, cross collaboration, I guess you could say, on equipment. So, if, if one product, uh, one part is ideal to make on this laser cutter, then we can use that for that in, uh, that part. We can also use a water jet cutter to use it. We can we can test what what is best to use. And this is a very versatile machine that um, is very helpful to have in the labs. And uh, we also train people on using this and enable access when we do open up. This will be on our on our public uh, self-directed list for uh, people to come in and use. So earlier you talked about how you did modifications to the motor and to the engine to make it more um, energy efficient. Do you do that too? Is that something you consider for all your machines or is it something that you just, it's just something you think about? Like you switched one foot to a hydraulic um, oh, um the, uh, the The shear actually came like that. That was from the manufacturer with those modifications. So we want to be careful about how much we actually modify on a machine. But every every machine has, um, when you use it, you learn about it and you see where improvements can be made. And uh, you know that's that's what's important is that you you don't just read the manual and 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 understand it from there. You you actually um, read the manual and then you use it and you learn how the machine operates and the little nuances that that each one has. Um, and getting that experience is really helpful. That's why it's it's so important to have that hands-on aspect when you're when you're uh, learning. You know, students come to us and have internships. We have volunteers. Uh, we we want to open the the learning um, opportunities, and uh, that creates more opportunities in the workforce as well. There's our new table saw, uh, saw stop table saw that is uh, very sensitive so that if your finger gets close to it or touches the blade, the blade retracts in less than a second so that uh, it minimizes any risk of injury. And then behind you there is the clicker press, the famous clicker press 
that we made many, many face shields on. Uh, this was a definitely a win for us and the community that we provided face shields to because the, uh, the material was cleaner, the production was faster, and it was the right decision to make in the process improvement to making the most face shields for the least cost and the least amount of waste. So our next steps are in the recycling. So if you look to your left over here, there's blue containers. These blue containers are actually full of the, the waste from the PPE efforts. And what we are working with now is some of our partners in the community and Department of Water and Power to develop systems so that we can actually recycle this material and put it back into either into the manufacturing manufacturing ecosystem or develop products that are beneficial. So um, we're really excited about the future of that, um, along with working with closed loop plastics to make more 3D printer filament. Uh, this That's uh, a strong focus for us in the circular economy efforts of the prototyping center. Can you explain the phrase circular economy, please? Oh, of course. Well, when you, when you have a material that gets used one time, it's not circular. It's not going back into the ecosystem to be used uh, for its original purpose again, or to be used for something else. So in the uh, methods of recycling, you have uh, reduce, reuse, and recycle, right? To, to, uh, you know, to ba basically, we want to put it back into the ecosystem, keep it out of landfills, it's waste diversion. So uh, that's our focus, is uh, basically to develop, you know, small processes to pilot that um, those efforts to demonstrate and teach people about recycling and what does it really look like, what does it take, um, and and keep um, the culture moving forward, being more, uh, being better stewards and uh, of more sustainable practices in manufacturing, and also open the doors, you know, to um, to new innovation. We have uh, startup companies like Rewilder that are make you know, that are using. The, uh, the waste from the auto manufacturing industry that, that dumps tons of, of fabrics and materials and, and uh, they're repurposing and they're making bags. And now they have products from, from airbags and seat belts. You know, and, and that's what we want to, to focus on is where are we wasting and what can we do with that um, to, to be responsible. So plastics, we're finding methods of using plastics or using cloth, any kind of what would be considered landfill waste to becoming a value added, or I don't know the right language, but cool. Are, th are there any questions from the audience? Please put them in the chat. So what are some of the coolest projects you've actually done in the uh, APC? I mean, oh. of course, it's I love that question. Uh, so one of the great uh, successes that we've had, we we built uh, many of the parts that assembled the first prototype for a company called Ampere. It was a hybrid electric airplane that is now seeing great success. Uh, they they now have a hangar in in Hawthorne next to SpaceX. They are making planes that are flying from island to island. And uh, that's one of the strong uh, cases that we've had in here. Uh, we also have worked with multiple startups to help them, help them with, their, um, with their hardware development. So um, there's companies that are making EVs right now that needed specific brackets and specific things welded. And we can basically address those, uh, those concerns and, and take in the request. EV as in electric vehicles, right? Yes. yes. Okay. Cool. And so we, other other projects. Well, um, the the key to the city is also a big one for us, and and that's really uh, it takes a, a community. It demonstrates the community uh, uh, 
resources as well. You know, we use um, the wood from, you know, fallen trees locally sourced. Uh, we're also, um, you know, interested in repurposing supplies that go back into the things that we build. Um, so I, I would think the PPE project is probably our biggest lift uh, mm -hmm. within the past couple of years. Um, but that's a, a, co a coalition essentially that was built um, during the pandemic in, you know, a very strongly presented need and it really helped a lot of people. Uh, so we're, we're uh, you know, honored to be a part of that. And, uh, so and this, for those, oh. I'm sorry, Lord. Oh, so no, I'm sorry. I was just going to add uh, another company that probably utilized the entire advanced prototyping center the best or, or the most fully, at least, was um, on robot. And their technology utilized the chemistry lab, the electronics lab, and the machine shop because they would make things like gecko grippers for, they would make essentially uh, gecko gripping hands for the end of robotic arms. So they'd use the chemistry lab to be able to make the gecko gripper, gecko gripper uh, adhesive like material, the electronics lab to be able to control the robot arm, then the machine shop to make the more structural components of all of that. So just wanted to throw them in there as a, uh, one of the companies that have really utilized the space. Cool. So, uh, so in order to use the space, you need an engineering background, or like, how did you get started in prototyping or learning these technologies? Nick, Lawrence, either of you. Uh, Lawrence, go ahead. Uh, for me, I feel like my interest in prototyping and technological spaces started when I was pretty little. Um, I can remember maybe my dad gave me like an old radio and he said, here, just go ahead and he'll give me a couple screwdrivers and a hammer and said, take it apart. And when I broke it apart, it's like, oh, I saw this little circuit board, you know, me a little kid, I'm eight years old. Like, oh, the circuit board looks like a miniature city. And I just found it entirely fascinating. Um, and then from there, you know, just seeing all of the technological advances, I figured um, engineering is something that I would be interested in. So I ended up uh, pursuing a degree in that. And then as I moved to LA and learned about this space, it was like, this is perfect. I just want to, you know, be able to brainstorm ideas with people who are trying to create new things. And then a huge plus is being able to make an impact. So working in a space that's targeted towards creating a greener environment technologically and just to make the planet a better place, this was the spot for me. Uh, awesome, Lord. He's a mechanical engineer from Columbia, he doesn't really talk too much about that, but he's a phenomenal creator. Um, and, and from my background, I grew up in prototyping and in shops. My father was a, a Disney Imagineer and uh, worked in aerospace. So I grew up in shops and with the, you know, we would, as, as a kid, I would go around and, and with him and, and take all of the different plastic parts that we had used up in the house and then turn it into a fantasy spaceship. And then we would have, I, I would submit them to the model contests that he had with some of his uh, friends at Lockheed. And um, then I started working for the fire department as a, a technician for the communications group and had the opportunity to be in the machine shop and ended up spending 13 years learning from um, very, very, um, amazing people in each different process of welding and CNC and manufacturing and learning how to put each one together to make a finished product. And what's the best way to do this most efficiently? And, and uh, I, that's really where I developed the love for the city uh, in understanding like, wow, these, these things that I'm making are helping people. I'm, I'm, I'm more interested to, to help people learn how to make this these things and to be able to solve a problem quickly, efficiently, and let the vehicle get back on the road to go save people. Uh, that was really what the core of my interest was. <laughs> so, uh, you know, sp spending time learning from experts in each different field and then getting that practice immediately and going, you know, for, uh, you know, for 13 years saying, okay, let's build this lab and let's make it successful. And now the, now the city has that. They, they use that lab to, 
help support the communications and the, the fire and police departments and the, the general services. I ended up getting to build things all over the city and city hall and mountaintops and police cars and fire trucks. And then I said, you know, I really want to do more to benefit the city. And what the beautiful thing that that Lacey has is that um, ability to be nimble, to, to en enable people that have an interest to learn, but that wouldn't really have access to that those resources. We can enable those that access. We can help startup companies. We can help education, and really be a great benefit to the city. Uh, so, in any way we can do that, that's that's our our interest. As well. I, I thank you so much for sharing your stories, Nick, and words. And thank you, Sharon. Also, um, I'm going to pop us this back to Diane, and she's going to close out the show. Thank you so much, everybody. This has been amazing. Wow, that was pretty amazing. Nick, Lawrence, V, thank you so much. Um, I mean, it's just amazing. I want to put solar panels in my house, my driveway, on top of the library. Let's make it happen, V. We can do this <laughs> with Nick and Lawrence's help. Um, so if you want to check this out later, this will be on our YouTube ch channel under our Maker Talk playlist. So you can keep watching this, and which is great. And I hope a lot of you will... Uh, try to um, apply to the makerforestlacy.org and we put that in the chat. There it is right there on the screen. It's pretty exciting stuff. Um, we wanna help make our city better. So I hope some people will apply. And the next Maker Talk, I believe it'll be in our online calendar, which is lapl.org forward slash events. And it'll be next month. And I believe it's February 9th at one o'clock and in case there's any changes, you just keep checking our um, online calendar. And it'll be with Marble School, the robotics program. So um, thanks to V for helping organize that. So remember, if you'd like to be one of our makers, please shoot us an email at uh, ecdept at lapl.org. Um, and let's try to make 2022 pretty exciting. And I also like to invite you all to be part of the um, GLOBE um, cloud challenge and you can check out that uh, we just had a program yesterday so check out our YouTube page it's fascinating information and it's a great partnership with NASA so um, help make our world a better place everybody and have an amazing weekend and check out all our other programs thanks and we'll see you next time